Welcome back to the program. Joining me now, Jonathan Martin, Politico's senior political column, columnist and po politics bureau chief. He's just Jonathan Martin with Politico to me, and he looks pretty good from uh, having a week of Mardi Gras under his belt there. Are you hanging in there all right? <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but the older you get, you know, the more tame it is. Uh, so now, now New Orleans is still the best city in the world and, and during Carnival, uh, it's in a peak form, Roby. So everybody in Arkansas, come on back down to uh, New Orleans. Life is good here. All right, let's talk about uh, Trump's legal woes were front yes. and center in the news all week long. They have been for months, but particularly this past week. The Biden special counsel report comes out, causes the uh, heartburn for the Biden administration. Right. Um, are, are these going to be our two nominees in the fall, Trump versus Biden? Are we headed for that again? Because there's a lot of speculation out there. The rematch uh, that, that over half the country apparently doesn't want uh, appears to be inexorable, Roby. Uh, it's hard to see a scenario where it's not going to be those two candidates. That said, politics moves quickly. You never want to say never. Events shape campaigns. They have since the dawn of democracy and um, uh, obviously could be events between now and November. But certainly today, where we said in February, Donald Trump has got a uh, firm grip on the Republican Party. There's obviously dissenters uh, in his party, uh, some of which uh, are in Arkansas, at, at least privately. Uh, but, you know, the, the majority of his party wants him to be their center bearer, and he's poised to do it again. Biden's a little bit more complicated, Roby, um, because, you know, obviously he's got profound challenges in terms of his popularity and the perceptions about his fitness to serve for four more years. But his party is similarly in the grip of Trump, just for different reasons. They're just so scared of Trump. They don't want to do anything to weaken Biden and, and sort of lessen their shot uh, in November. So they're going to step with, with, with Biden. All right. Uh, in the U.S. Congress, we have a big debate on foreign aid as well as immigration reform. We see the House is fairly, uh, I'm sorry, the Senate is fairly splintered on things. The House, mm -hmm. to me, is just almost in disarray. I mean, I'm just surprised yes. they can turn the lights on and off at the end of the day <laughs> uh, with all the botched votes, botched investigations, yeah, no clear mess. really, uh, no clear agenda per se. How, how yeah. fractious are things in Washington, D.C.? Sure. And, Maybe just speak to what we have witnessed sure. the last couple of weeks and what's on the sure. near term horizon there. Well, you know, and private Democrats are petrified about President Biden's prospects and they're obviously concerned about the, the view of his age, uh, you know, among voters. They don't dare say that out loud um, because they don't want to weaken Biden and they're going to stick with the one they got. Uh, turn off the Netflix, folks. There's not going to be a contested convention this summer in Chicago. That's a Hollywood fantasy. At the same time, the Republicans are more openly divided. It's not in private, uh, Roby. Their divisions are on display. You see them in the U.S. Senate, where basically half the Senate GOP votes for this foreign aid package and half doesn't. Right there in Arkansas, you've got the, the same split playing out. You know, John Bozeman, not known as a big foreign policy player, votes yes. Uh, I thought a courageous vote uh, at this time, especially in our deep red state like Arkansas, where Trump is so popular. And Tom Cotton, you know, widely seen as this uber hawk, uh, votes against the package. Now, I think his concern was, was more about what wasn't in there, which is the immigration language. But still, for Tom Cotton uh, to vote against aiding the Israelis, Ukrainians, and the Taiwanese, it's striking. Um, it sort of tells you where the party is right now from a raw political standpoint. And as you point out, Roby, the House, total disarray, and they can barely keep the lights on. In fact, they might not even be able to do that because the government could shut down come March. So you've got the Dems who are you know, deeply concerned, but keeping it private, and the Republicans who are divided, but it's very much out in the open. Uh, it's it's a sight to behold. I'm just telling you, it's one of those things. I just wake up every day and I wonder, I'm like, well, what debacle are we going to witness uh, unfold here? Right. Uh, let's okay, talk. I, really, I, think, I think you basically have a Republican Party. It's really two parties now under one roof. It's basically a pre-Trump party, the kind of traditional Bush wing of the party, which is, you know, approximately a third, uh, you know, of the GOP. And then the rest of the two thirds is comfortable with Trump. And you see that playing out when it comes to foreign policy. You see it playing out when it comes to this, this primary between Nikki Haley and, and President Trump. And you see it really 
uh, in the elected officials across the country. They're mostly Trumpy, but there's still plenty who are in that, that pre-Trump wing. Yeah, going to be interested to see what happens when we know the results and see whatever potentially falls out uh, after November. It'll be interesting on both sides of the political aisle uh, at, on that Absolutely. one, because if Trump loses, then perhaps the Republican Party gets to move into the post-Trump age, but there's still going to be right. the element there. And if Biden loses, then you've got, you know, a whole new uh, set of, you know, potential candidates that are going to want to try to fill that void. That's going to be fascinating, yep. isn't it? Oh, you know, it'll be interesting because, you know, the GOP has lost a uh, number of elections since 2017 uh, under President Trump, um, you know, at every level of government. But again, you know, the bulk of the party still likes him and is okay with him. If he loses again, there will be some efforts at a reformation, uh, a political one. Um, but I, as you point out, not everybody in the party is going to want to sign on for that reformation. There's going to be some who still want the old church. And so that'll be interesting to see. Uh, and at the same time, if Biden loses, my God, there will be such such an outcry of we never should have nominated him. We, we shouldn't have sort of gone with the old guy. We need new blood and a new face. Uh, and that obviously is not going to bode well for, for Kamala Harris, who, of course, is tied to Biden. It'll open up the Democratic Party in a way that it won't be open if Biden does win re-election, Roby. All right, we've got about two minutes left here. Who's going to yeah. control the House and the Senate? What are yeah. the odds makers kind of putting things out yeah. right now? How's that map yeah. shaping up for control of the House and control of the Senate? Because it's pretty tight. Well, I'm glad you asked because, you know, the, the presidential every four years always gets the bulk of the attention. And that's even more the case this year because we have this extraordinary election where it's a former president versus an incumbent president. And the former president's facing 91 felony charges. The incumbent president's going on 82 years old. And so that's really taking all the oxygen out of the room. But you've got extremely close margins in the House and the Senate. Basically, the Dems have a one seat majority in the Senate. Republicans have a two seat majority in the House, uh, at least uh, at the moment. And so I think, Ru Roby, it's totally plausible that no matter what happens on the top of the ticket, Democrats could flip the House and Republicans could keep the Senate. In fact, I think it's likely that that's the scenario in 2025, that you have a, a, a GOP-controlled Senate and you have a Democratic-controlled House. Um, obviously, that would, you know, bode well for Arkansas's two senators who would then be uh, in the majority, not so much in the House. Um, although I think if, if Trump does win the presidency, I think Senator Cotton may become Secretary Cotton or Director Cotton uh, at Langley, uh, which is probably a different chat for a different day. Um, but I, I think that we're going to have... Um, uh, likely today, both chambers flip. Very, very interesting stuff. And look at you just throwing trial balloons out there, Jonathan Martin. You're going to stir up the political dust here in Arkansas. What we're here to do on Sundays, Roby. Let's right. do it. You need to get on down here to Arkansas. I'm going to give and, you a, a tour. And, and maybe Governor Sanders, you know, uh, rejoining the Trump administration in some capacity, uh, you know, which could then then uh, shake up things in Arkansas. And uh who knows what would happen in 26 for the governor's, right? 15 seconds left. Do you think she's on the short list for VP? I think she's definitely on the list for VP. I'm not sure how short that list is right now, but, but sitting here today in February, she's definitely on it. All right. He's Jonathan Martin, senior political columnist, politics bureau chief for Politico. You can read his stuff daily at politico.com. Jonathan, thank you so much. Thanks, Roby. Go Hogs. <laughs> All right, we're back with more after this.